Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dina Brown. I'm the Emerging Trends Consultant at Idaho Commission for Libraries and it is my pleasure to welcome you today to today's info to go webinar sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and hosted by the Idaho Commission for Libraries. Some things to think about before we get started. Uh, everyone is muted on entry and we encourage you to use the chat to ask questions. Speaking of which, we are going to be kind of uh, going through all the questions at the end. So feel free to put them in the chat as they come up during the presentation. And Annie and I will do our best to make sure that we go back through and get all of them covered. Um, also speaking of the chat, uh, we recommend that you update your chat settings to go to all panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see the questions that you're putting in there. Today, we're trying uh, automatically generated closed captions. So please know these captions may be slightly inaccurate, but our hope is that they help make this webinar more accessible to those attending live. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Annie Gaines, the continuing education consultant here at the Idaho Commission for Libraries. Annie, take it away. Thanks, Dina. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, like Dina said, my name is Annie. I'm the CE consultant at the Idaho Commission for Libraries. In my role, I maintain a series of online courses about library work, the ABLE courses that introduce some of the, oops, sorry, that introduced some fundamental topics about libraries and uh, library ethics is one of them. And this webinar is designed as an introduction to library ethics by walking through the American Library Association's Code of Ethics. My plan is to talk through each of the nine articles and then offer things to consider for each one. These slides will be made available to all attendees, and I'll do my best to add links to the chat as I mention them. Um, before I get started, I'm going to turn my camera off because that makes me more comfortable. And you might hear my cat in the background. Okay, so library ethics is defined as the body of moral principles or values governing or distinctive of a particular culture or group. So why do ethics matter? Because ethics affect behavior. Responsible behavior, regardless of personal biases, is the result of adhering to values or ethics. While most people have personal ethics that affect their daily behavior, there are also, also ethics in the workplace. Librarianship is a profession and like most professions, it has codes of ethics, that is, a shared set of principles and fundamental values that serve as guidelines for professional conduct. For example, doctors, lawyers, social workers, and teachers all subscribe to their own codes of ethics. It's important to understand the ethics of your professional workplace as they provide a background or framework for creating policies, procedures, and guidelines which influence day-to-day -day activities. If you're in a position to create policies or procedures, understanding the ethics of the workplace will ensure that those policies and procedures are reasonable ones. If you're not a policymaker, understanding the ethics or values that shape library policies will help you be more effective in carrying out your responsibilities. How ethical issues are handled will vary according to the type of library in which you work, the community your library serves, and your library's governance and administrative structures. School, public, academic, and special libraries all have issues that are unique to their particular library communities. It's important to have policies, procedures, and guidelines in place to address these issues when conflicts arise. The American Library Association Code of Ethics lists the fundamental principles of the library profession. The Code of Ethics is a document that translates the values of intellectual freedom that define our profession into broad statements. And I'm now gonna read it out loud. 
As members of the American Library Association, we recognize the importance of codifying and making known to the profession and to the general public the ethical principles that guide the work of librarians, other professionals providing information services, library trustees, and library staff. Ethical dilemmas occur when values are in conflict. The American Library Association Code of Ethics states the values to which we are committed and embodies the ethical responsibilities of the profession in this changing information environment. We significantly influence or control the selection, organization, preservation, and dissemination of information. In a political system grounded in an informed citizenry, we are members of, of a profession explicitly committed to intellectual freedom and the freedom of access to information. We have a special obligation to ensure the free flow of information and ideas to present and future generations. The principles of this code are expressed in broad statements to guide ethical decision making. These statements provide a framework they cannot and do not dictate conduct to cover particular situations. Number one, we provide the highest level of service to all library users through appropriate and usefully organized resources, equitable service policies, equitable access, and accurate, unbiased, and courteous responses to all requests. We uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources. We protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. We respect the intellectual property rights and advocate balance between the interests of information users and rights holders. We treat coworkers and other colleagues with respect, fairness, and good faith, and advocate conditions of employment that safeguard the rights and welfare of all employees of our institutions. We do not advance private interests at the expense of library users, colleagues, or our employing institutions. We distinguish between our personal convictions and professional duties and do not allow our personal beliefs to interfere with fair representation of the aims of our institutions or the provision of access to their information resources. We strive for excellence in the profession by maintaining and enhancing our own knowledge and skills, by encouraging the professional development of coworkers, and by fostering the aspirations of potential members of the profession. And we affirm the inherent dignity and rights of every person. We work to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases, to confront inequity and oppression, to enhance diversity and inclusion, and to advance racial and social justice in our libraries, communities, profession, and associations through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration, services, and allocation of resources and spaces. Whew. This code of ethics was first adopted at the 1939 midwinter meeting by the ALA Council, and it's since been amended in 1981, 1995, 2008, and 2021. So let's take a look at that first article again. It says, we provide the highest level of service to all library users through appropriate and usefully organized resources, equitable service policies, equitable access, and accurate, unbiased, and courteous responses to all requests. Equitable access is central to library services. From an ethical standpoint, the library is obligated to offer equitable services and accurate, friendly, and unbiased responses to questions. Library policies should also be written with equity in mind. All patrons who walk into the library, regardless of origin, age, background, or views, should receive service to meet their needs. Equity refers to the fair and equal treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people. 
Although equity and equality are related, they refer to different concepts. Equality ensures that all are afforded the same treatment, the same chances, the same resources, while equity ensures that all obtain what they need to succeed. Equity recognizes that people have circumstances beyond their control. Barriers to equal access could include race, disability, lack of money, or access to equipment or training. Libraries help ensure that people can access the information they need, regardless of age, origin, background, views, socioeconomic status, physical limitations, or geographic barriers. Good library staff members will use their professional and social skills to welcome patrons and put them at ease. Some examples of equitable access include uh, a college or university library making textbooks available for checkout so students who cannot afford to purchase the books can still have access to them. Or in parking lots, the parking spaces closest to building entrances are reserved for people with mobility issues, allowing them to have equitable access to the library's facilities. Libraries are continuously thinking of new ways of providing equitable service to meet their patrons' needs. As part of the library, you should be thinking about it too. The hallmark of professional service is according all patrons the same level of courtesy, respect, and library service, whether in person, by phone, or via email. If you're in charge of the physical layout of the library, make sure the aisles are free of obstacles so someone using a wheelchair can get through. If you work on the library's website, it's important to make sure that it's fully accessible and compatible with screen reading software. The library belongs to everyone, so equitable access is foundational to library work. If you're interested in more information about this topic, I recommend you check out the ALA's Access to Library Resources and Services page. I'll put that link in the chat now. All right, so let's move on to Article 2 which states, we uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources. ALA defines intellectual freedom as the right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. It provides for free access to all expressions of ideas through which any and all sides of a question, cause, or movement may be explored. Intellectual freedom encompasses the freedom to hold, receive, and disseminate ideas. It's a core value of the library profession and a cornerstone of democracy. Censorship is a change in the access status of material based on the content of the work and made by a governing authority or its representatives. Such changes include exclusion, restriction, removal, or age or grade level changes. Challenge is an attempt to remove or restrict materials based on the objections or a person or group. Challenges do not simply involve a person expressing a point of view, rather they're an attempt to remove material from the curriculum or library, thereby restricting the access of others. Banning is the removal of those materials. Libraries play an important role in promoting intellectual freedom by making all types of information available in an organized manner. In addition, libraries support literacy and the individual's right to read. Requests to ban or remove books from collections do happen, and it's important for libraries to be prepared. The most important way to prepare is to have a written collection development policy approved by the library's governing authority, either the library board or the school board that discusses what to do in case of a challenge. The American Library Association has a website dedicated to supporting libraries through a challenge process, which contains guidelines, policy toolkits, and advice on how to respond to challenges if they happen. The library should have specific procedures for handling challenges. All public service staff members should be acquainted with those policies and trained in the procedures to follow when a challenge is made. Remember, anyone has the right to express a concern and the person filing the challenge should be treated with respect. 
Be sure to explain the library's policies and procedures for submitting a formal challenge and hand them a copy of the library's collection development policy and the form to the person wishing to make the challenge. Once you've done so, it's important to say nothing more on the topic. The ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom encourages all challenges to be reported through their online form. All reports made through the form are confidential and anyone can make a report. The Office of Intellectual Freedom also provides confidential support during censorship challenges to library materials, services, and programs. You might also wish to enlist the support of local organizations. In fact, if, if local civic, religious, educational, and political organizations understand your selection and service policies, they may be more supportive when a challenge does occur. I urge you to do everything possible to retain library materials that meet the standards established in the library's collection development policy. In order to ensure intellectual freedom, it's important not to restrict or remove any materials until a decision has been made by the library director or the director's designee. While many of these steps indicate action that needs to be taken by the library director, quite often library staff members working with the public will be the first to hear complaints or whispers of a challenge. It may not be your responsibility to follow through with the response, but your understanding of the library selection and service policies and procedures will help make certain that the challenge is addressed in a professional and timely manner. If you're not sure about the policies and procedures of your library, consult with your library's policy manual to learn about them. Your library director or department head can answer your questions about those policies. A quick note before moving on about um, internet access and filtering. So internet access in libraries is a bit controversial. Uh, oops. Um, especially as it relates to minors. In 2000, Congress passed the Children's Internet Protection Act, CIPA, requiring public libraries to install filters on computers in order to block websites that contain offensive materials. This requirement is a condition of receiving federal funds and E-rate funding. While the intent of the law is to protect children from pornography, most people in the library profession view the law as a violation of our professional ethics, contending that by censoring information, the law violates the principles of equal access for all and intellectual freedom. Because no filter is perfect, some legitimate websites are going to be blocked. And in addition, these filters are designed to detect keywords, not images. Moving on, Article 3 says, we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. So the right to privacy, the right to read, consider, and develop ideas and beliefs free from observation or unwanted surveillance is the bedrock foundation for intellectual freedom. Privacy is essential to free inquiry in the library because it enables you, library users to select, access, and consider information and ideas without fear of embarrassment, judgment, punishment, or ostracism. A lack of privacy in the library can have a significant and chilling effect on public library users' willingness to exercise their First Amendment right to read, impairing access to ideas. While privacy and confidentiality go hand in hand, there are some differences in their meanings. While privacy focuses on the rights of users, confidentiality is the responsibility of the library. Confidentiality exists when a library is in possession of personally identifiable information about patrons and keeps that information private on their behalf. The responsibility of confidentiality is assumed when libraries require or keep records such as browsing history, interlibrary loan slips, computer signup sheets, or research notes. Personally identifiable information is information that not only identifies a particular person, but also tells something about that person. For example, what books someone checks out, 
In libraries, there are many forms of personal, personally identifiable information used daily, such as circulation records, computer signup sheets, and overdue or reserve notices. Libraries try their best to limit the amount of personally identifiable information that is collected, monitored, disclosed, and retained, while also fulfilling their duty to comply with their state's library confidentiality statute. Here are three practices a library can adopt to reduce the risk of having patrons' personal identifiable information disclosed. So first, evaluate the information collected about individuals and request only what is absolutely necessary. For example, the library has no real reason to request a patron's social security number and storing this information may turn out to be a legal liability for the library. The patron's driver's license number and date of birth are sufficient for ID purposes. Know the legal requirements for keeping this information and destroy it as soon as possible. If you're in Idaho, your ICFL area field consultant can answer your public records questions. All staff members should be aware of their privacy and confidentiality responsibilities. Only appropriate paid staff members need to have access to patron records. Volunteers cannot be held to the same privacy standards as paid staff, and so should not perform circulation duties except for shelving. Library staff members have an obligation to protect the privacy of patrons and to keep their information needs confidential. When discussing patron transactions or issues with other staff members, it's important to respect patron privacy by keeping conversations confidential and revealing only as much information to their colleagues as is needed to respond to the patron's request. In addition, library staff have a professional obligation not to discuss specific library users with friends or colleagues in or out of the workplace. Article four, article four says, we respect intellectual property rights and advocate balance between the interests of information users and rights holders. Intellectual property is defined as a product of the human intellect. It can be tangible in physical form like a painting or intangible like a complex idea or equation. Patents, trademarks, and copyrighted works are all intellectual property and are protected by US copyright law. Patents protect inventions and discoveries. A trademark protects words and phrases and symbols that identify products and services in a way that distinguishes them from others. And copyright is a form of protection provided by the laws of the United States to the authors of original works, including literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works. In the most recent comprehensive law, the Copyright Act of 1976, it generally gives the owner of a, of a copyright the exclusive rights to the work. And that term for copyright depends on several factors, including whether it has been published and the first date it was published. As an example, works created on or after January 1st, 1978 are automatically protected for the life of the author plus an additional 70 years. When the time has come for, an, for when the time has expired for a work to be protected by copyright, it becomes part of the public domain. As of January 1st of this year, works published from 1925 and before are in the public domain. Most library staff members won't need to know the time limits for copyright, but it can be helpful, helpful to know that they exist and where to find that information. ALA occasionally offers a course on fair use in the library and Library Juice Academy offers an excellent copyright course. Intended to balance the interests of information seekers and rights holders, the doctrine of fair use allows for limited use of copyright materials under certain conditions. The fair use doctrine has a significant effect on libraries. Libraries have an ethical as well as legal obligation to practice fair use. It's described in section 107 of the copyright law. Deciding whether the use of a copyrighted item is fair use or not depends on four factors, the purpose and character of the use, 
the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. Each factor must be measured on a sliding scale. So for example, the scale leans towards fair use if the use is made for nonprofit educational purposes, if the material used is factual in nature, if the amount of the work that is used is proportionally small, and if there's likely to be no effect on the market value for the item itself. On the other hand, the scale leans away from fair use if the purpose is commercial, if the work is highly creative, or if large portions of the work are used, and if the use is made in place of having a legal copy. So for example, in course reserves, instructors often make available small portions of books for student readings, but cannot copy and make available the entire copyrighted work, the entire book. Fair use also permits libraries to reproduce one copy of a work to replace missing or damaged materials if a replacement cannot be purchased at a reasonable price. In addition, libraries may copy items for their patrons. Only one copy of an item can be made and the copyright notice is supposed to appear on the copy. A library can also photocopy a page to replace a missing page in a book or magazine. Class projects presented to a teacher or a class can include portions of copyrighted material because it's educational use and only a portion of the copyrighted work is used. And outside of education, fair use also covers things like parody. This allows shows like Saturday Night Live or artists like Weird Al Yankovic to poke fun at a copyrighted work in their own transformative way. Article five says that we treat coworkers and other colleagues with respect, fairness, and good faith and advocate conditions of employment that safeguard the rights and welfare of all employees of our institutions. It's not just what we do for our patrons that's important. What we do for each other is important too. We treat our colleagues with the same level of respect and concern that we give our patrons. Respect is the feeling of regarding someone well for their qualities or traits, but respect can also be the action of treating people with appreciation and dignity. As an employee, you can respect your coworkers and supervisors by giving them the intention they need, listening to their opinions and speaking with kindness. Fairness in the workplace is just as important as it is anywhere else. A workplace where employees feel like they're not beated, being treated fairly will result in lower productivity, lack of motivation, and negative relationships. In order to ensure fairness, show that there's equal access to opportunity, clear processes, and open communication, and a feedback system which facilitates constructive conversations. The covenant of good faith is an unspoken agreement in an employee employer relationship. The good faith covenant means that an employer owes an employee a duty to act in good faith and to deal fairly with them. And the employee has the same duty to the employer. For example, this would require the employer to only fire employees when they have good cause. An employer shouldn't fire employees to replace them with cheaper labor, nor should they fire an employee to prevent them from getting benefits. This article also asks us to advocate for working conditions that safeguard the rights and welfare of all employees of our institution. This could be advocating for more inclusive hiring practices, paying attention to workplace safety, and encouraging employee policies that are fairly written and implemented. Article six states, we do not advance private interests at the expense of library users, colleagues, 
or our employing institutions. Private interests are any personal gains of benefit, privilege, exemption, or advantage that are not available to the general public. Library staff should not use the resources of a library for personal benefit. Advancing private interests while working for a public institution such as the library creates a conflict of interest. For example, a library staff member should not be put in a position to make collection development decisions that will benefit them or their families. If a database is being considered for purchase and a library staff member's spouse is a sales representative for that database, the library staff member would not be involved in making that decision. By paying attention to potential conflicts of interest, the library ensures the appropriate use of library resources and assures the public good. As a library staff member, you can avoid conflicts of interests by observing boundaries between your personal and professional roles. Although friends or relatives may ask you for favors, like extending a checkout period or setting aside a popular new book for them, it's important to treat them like any other patron. Article seven says, we distinguish between our personal convictions and professional duties and do not allow our personal beliefs to interfere with fair representation of the aims of our institution or the provision of access to their information resources. In other words, be objective. A library employee's personal beliefs should not limit a patron's search for or use of information. Professionals in charge of selecting library materials keep their personal beliefs separate from decision making. And although libraries may help patrons identify and research issues of an upcoming election, they don't promote one political candidate or party over another. This also means answering questions with accurate information in non judgmental interactions. Any question asked by a patron is an important one, and so we treat both the question and the patron with respect. A question from a child may not take as much effort to answer as one from an adult, but the child deserves just as much attention. It's not our job to judge whether or not a question is worth answering. One of the most difficult challenges in reference work is to maintain neutral about the subject matter. You may feel a strong emotional reaction to certain questions because you're uncomfortable thinking about them or because your convictions differ from those of a patron. Nevertheless, it is your job to look at the questions from the point of view of an impartial professional. If you encounter a patron request that takes you outside of your comfort zone, take a deep breath, count to 10, and then provide the best answer you can using the resources at your library. Use this as an opportunity to hone your skills in evaluating reference materials by guiding your patron to the most authoritative sources available. Article 8 states, we strive for excellence in the profession by maintaining and enhancing our own knowledge and skills, by encouraging the professional development of coworkers, and by fostering the aspirations of potential members of the profession. Librarianship is a profession, and that means keeping up with changes in the global community of practice. This article focuses on continuing education, which includes maintaining and expanding your knowledge and skills. As a library employee, there are lots of ways to increase your knowledge and skills. The library itself has a wealth of services and resources, and learning about them, even in areas you don't work in, can help you learn more about the profession. Your experiences, skills, and perspectives are valuable and can play a key role in the professional development of your library colleagues. After working in the library for a while, you may wish to consider helping to train and mentor new employees. You'll be giving them a leg up while refreshing and sharpening your own skills. And always ask questions. If there's something you're interested in or want to know more about, there's no harm in asking. There are library blogs and podcasts, webinars, magazines, journals, and books available for your own professional development, as well as online courses provided by organizations like Info People, Library Juice Academy, and Amigos Library Services. These offer a huge variety of courses on any topic you can imagine and at pretty affordable prices. 
The Idaho Commission for Libraries provides financial support to Idaho library staff members wishing to attend online courses from these providers through our continuing education program. If you wanna know more about this program, visit our website. And if you're not in Idaho, your own state library agency might also provide a similar service. If you're interested in taking four credit courses, there are undergraduate college level courses in library science and graduate degrees in library and information science. In Idaho, there are independent study library science courses available. There is currently no in-person library science school in the state of Idaho, but the School of Library and Information Management at Emporia State University is quite active in training librarians and information professionals. Nearby schools include the University of Washington and San Jose State University. If you're interested in learning more about graduate degrees in library science, try chatting with others in the profession about their background and experience. The Idaho Commission for Libraries will also provide a financial support to Idaho library staff members who are pursuing a library science graduate degree or taking independent study library science courses. If you'd like more information about that, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. Whenever possible, I encourage you to attend professional library conferences to expand your knowledge and skills. Each state has its own yearly conference and many national and regional organizations also host in-person and virtual library conferences. These continuing education events are a great opportunity to learn from others in the profession, expanding your knowledge. The Idaho Commission for Libraries will financially support Idaho library staff attending an in-person library conference for the first time. If you'd like more information about that, go to the link I just put in the chat. And don't forget about fostering the aspirations of potential new members of the profession. We need to support the ambitions of library employees who want to advance in librarianship in the future. I think the best way to do this is to be authentic and encouraging. A lot of us in the library profession had a light bulb moment when we realized that this magical, wonderful place of the library was also a place of employment, that librarianship could be a career. And most of the time it was someone working in a library or really multiple people who helped guide us to where we are today. On June 29th, 2021, the ALA Council unanimously passed a motion to adopt a new ninth article to the ALA Code of Ethics. It says, we affirm the inherent dignity and rights of every person. We work to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases, to confront inequity and oppression, to enhance diversity and inclusion, and to advance racial and social justice in our libraries, communities, profession, and associations through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration, services, and allocation of resources and spaces. I'm very excited to see this edition. This article reads like it's putting our previously stated values into action. Uh, in our mission to provide equitable library services, we must confront inequities rather than just acknowledge them. We must do the work to be more inclusive, confronting the oppressive systems that prevent diversity. We must advance racial and social justice in our libraries because that is what happens when we lean into our values. As I mentioned, this is a new addition to the Code of Ethics, only recently adopted by the ALA Council. And I actually heard about this on Twitter as folks were live tweeting the ALA Council session. I'm really looking forward to the robust conversation about this new article in the coming months. So we've just spent a good amount of time talking through the Code of Ethics. These nine principles help to guide us as library professionals, regardless of the type or location of the library we serve. They're also not the only ethical guide we have as librarians. Here are some others to name a few. The Library Bill of Rights, the ACRL Core Ethics for Special Collections, and the Core Professional Values for the Teen Services Profession. 
there's a lot of value in codifying the professional the profession's ethical principles into these articles. Not only does it help us communicate our values with each other, but it also helps us make our principles clearer to the general public. I hope that this has helped you understand library ethics more clearly. Our professional ethics serve as a framework for our behavior and actions in libraries. If you're in a position to create or change library policies or procedures, understanding this ethical framework can help you establish reasonable policies and procedures. If you're a library staff member, understanding these values and how they shape library policies can help you be more effective and more confident in carrying out your ethical responsibilities to your patrons, your profession, and yourselves. And that's all I have for you. And I see in the chat, there's a request to put a link to the updated code of ethics. And from what I understand, last time I checked, they hadn't updated the website. Um, so it still doesn't have the ninth article. That's what I'm thinking. So I pulled the full text of the new article from, ooh, it was, a, it was a, a summary of the ALA Council session that listed every motion. So I'm gonna pull up that website link really quick. And Annie, once you've done that, it looks like there's a request to pull up the, um, the page that had the alternative resources. Awesome. And I'm happy to go find links to the Bill of Rights, the ACRL, and the YELSA resources. So give me a second. Thanks, Tina. Awesome. There's the link for the Library Bill of Rights. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, feel free to type in any questions or comments in the chat. I know this is kind of a meaty topic, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. There's the link for the ACRL Special Collections Core Ethics document. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending. Yes, so this is recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel. It will also be listed on our website. And if you attended this webinar, you'll be getting a link to the, to the file on YouTube. You'll be getting um, a copy of the slides and you'll be getting a list of all of the links that I sent out in this uh, webinar as well. So we'll be getting a good email follow-up. Uh, question from Joshua, doing any other webinars on library ethics in the future? Um, what other topics, it's possible, what other topics would you be interested in for library ethics? And then there was an earlier question. Um, has anyone had any issues with the burgeoning discussions about critical race theory and library materials? So I think that was maybe just a general question out to everyone. Um, and yes, uh, I can work in a way to get um, continuing education certificates to the folks who attended as well. Thanks, Joshua. Um, yeah, so if you are sort of just getting started in libraries, um, I would recommend 
uh, there's some great online courses through Web Junction. Web Junction is a great provider of online CE. Um, and I feel like they do a great job of talking about library fundamentals. Um, so that might be a place to start, Joshua. Slide with professional development. So looping back to, I think it was Kathy's question, the was perhaps the one about critical race theory. I um, I do not have any insights to add to that. I have there are a couple of um, library groups that I'm a part of. So, since I don't work in a in a library where I'm interfacing face to face with library users, um, my experience is a little different. But I have seen um, some discussions among library staff in like um, on Facebook. So there's like library think tank um, there's a which is a, a great group to be a part of um, and then there is also a facebook group i believe it's um, anti-racist librarians let me go double check on the name of that group but there have been folks kind of posting some questions here and there and um, showing support and sharing resources in those areas if you're looking for um, yeah anti-racist librarians if you're looking for a place to um, to kind of ask the, the greater librarianship brain um, on certain issues. Um, just to follow up on that, I would recommend checking out um, Project Ready, which is a, an online learning uh, uh, system curriculum curriculum that's uh it's reimagining equity and access for diverse youth and i think it does a fantastic job of introducing these concepts and talking about uh, race and inequity in libraries specifically um, and really tying that to our values as a profession i i really like the the project ready curriculum i think it's really great And um, Heather, I think, has a really great point where this is where um, policies that we have in place can be things that we can loop back to as a way to address um, challenges that might be coming um, towards materials and collections uh, as it relates to critical race theory. Um, it looks like Heather's had LGBTQIA plus as well. Agreed, Heather, if you don't have a strong collection development policy, now is definitely the time to get one. Um, and the great thing is, is that lots of libraries have their collection development policies posted publicly on their website. So um, you can go, if, you, if your library doesn't have one, lots of possibilities to go out and find ones that will work for you and or a great opportunity to reach out to your uh, library colleagues, um, folks that work perhaps at other libraries that are of the same size as yours and talk to them about how they developed their, um, their collection development policy. Yes. Um, there's a question about international sources for library ethics. Um, and I, you know, I haven't done a lot of research into that, but I would imagine in a similar way that the, the ALA um, sort of creates these documents uh, and they're decided on by the members. Um, other countries either have a national library that decides those policies or has a similar national level organization. Um, so I would recommend starting, there we go, Heather, Heather has a link for the UK. Um, so start looking at the country that you're at and, and see what those policies are, um, or maybe even geographically the ones that are nearby. Those could be interesting. You could also have a look at IFLA, which, which I just put in the chat, which is the International Federation of Library Associations, and they do have a, um, a code of ethics um, 
that might be a place to get started if that's something that you're needing to, to develop for your area. Yes, and IFLA has a uh, internet manifesto um, that's really excellent uh, that I was looking at when I was writing about our ethics and, and internet privacy or internet filtering laws. Um, so the internet manifesto from, from IFLA is an interesting um, document. I will find that and link that as well. There we go. Well, thank you everyone for coming. This was very fun. Thank you for all of the, the interaction and the questions. Um, thank you so much for attending. If you have follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me by email. I'm gonna try to get to the end here. Uh, feel free to reach out to me by email. Um, thank you so much for attending. As this webinar ends, you're gonna be prompted to complete a survey. So uh, please do that, complete that survey. We're always interested in your honest feedback. Um, everyone who attended is gonna receive a follow-up email with lots of goodies in it. Um, I think that's all I have for you guys. So thank you so much for attending and have an excellent day. <laughs>